I will be the first to admit that I was a hater. I did not buy into the cycle sinking hype because it was not backed by research. But here we are several years later, I've had a baby. I came off of hormonal birth control, experienced the roller coaster that is postpartum and breastfeeding, got my cycle back. And I will admit I had gained some perspective and I was probably asking the wrong questions because it's not a matter of is it backed by research, but is there even research? Recent reports suggest that women make up only about 20% of research participants in exercise science, physiology, and related fields. So not only is there a lack of research on women, but when it comes to menstrual cycles specifically, there's also a lack of quality, whether that's due to small sample sizes, self-reporting rather than quantitative testing, inconsistent terminology, which makes it difficult to compare findings and continue progressing our understanding. So with that, welcome to the series where we're gonna set the record straight on cycle syncing. We are gonna do a deep dive into the science and experience backed tips that are gonna transform your mindset and your movement as a menstruating woman, whether you choose to cycle sync or not. My goal is that by the end of this, you will have a deeper awareness of your body and feel confident adapting your movement to support your hormone health, exercise performance, and overall consistency with your routine. I think we can agree that one of the worst parts of having a cycle is the digestive distress. One of the best ways to offset this is by staying hydrated, which is why I'm so excited to be partnering with Element for today's episode. If you haven't heard of Element, it is a science-backed electrolyte blend that contains all of the minerals you need without any of the sugar or artificial ingredients that you don't. The concept for Element was born from the growing body of research suggesting that optimal health comes from a sodium intake two to three times the current government recommendation. You've seen me mix this every morning as part of my morning routine. A common misconception, especially in the fitness space, is that hydration is just about chugging a ton of water. When in reality, proper hydration, keeping your digestion moving and your body thriving, is about having the right balance of fluids to minerals in your body. So if you want to check out Element for yourself, they have done an offer for our community where when you shop via my link, they will send you a sample pack to try all of their flavors for free. My favorites lately have been the raspberry salt. That is, the, that is this one, the grapefruit, as well as citrus salt. As the weather gets warmer though, in the summer, I love a mango chili. So do what you will. All of the info for that will be in the description box down below. So cycle syncing is the practice of aligning your lifestyle choices with the hormonal changes that occur throughout your menstrual cycle. It is not just yoga and stretching. It is not about being lazy or giving yourself an out. There is nothing weak about honoring your body. Depending who you talk to, they will have different reasons for this practice. The way that I see it is as a strategy to live with less resistance and be more efficient. For the longest time, I saw my cycle as a nuisance and so I'd ignore it. I'm sure you can think of a time where the last thing you wanted to do was work out, but you were so fixated on maintaining your routine that you made yourself do it anyway. Maybe it was a good workout, maybe it wasn't, but it probably took a lot more discipline and mental energy than maybe was necessary, which when you're constantly flexing that willpower every day, it feels like an uphill battle. That is a fast track to burnout and falling off track completely. So throughout this series, we'll be focusing on exercise specifically, but you can also cycle sync your nutrition, sleep. I've even seen people do it with their social and lifestyle scheduling. Going back to high school health or what I wish they taught in high school health, your menstrual cycle beyond preparing your body for a potential pregnancy can also serve as an indicator as to how your body is responding to your workouts, nutrition, and lifestyle as a whole. I actually made an entire video all about hormones. I will link it down below where we talk about hormone balance, how your workouts and nutrition affect this, as well as the cortisol connection. Long story short, chronic stress is big bad. When your stress levels are chronically elevated, this can have a cascade of effects on the other hormones in your body, including those required to regulate and maintain a regular menstrual cycle. I was on the birth control pill 
for over 10 years. I only learned about eight years in that it in fact did not regulate my cycle as promised. I didn't actually even have a cycle because I was not getting a real period, but rather a withdrawal bleed. Maybe that's a topic for another video. As a side note, cycle syncing has limited relevance if you are on hormonal birth control, but focusing in on, we'll call them natural cycles, most cycles are between 21 and 35 days. Of course, every cycle is unique. You may even find that your own varies. Starting with the menstrual phase, this marks the start of your cycle and involves the shedding of the uterine lining, aka your period. During this phase, estrogen and progesterone are at their lowest, which may contribute to feelings of fatigue and discomfort. Next up, you have the follicular phase. During this time, your body prepares for the possibility of pregnancy by stimulating the growth of ovarian follicles, each containing an egg egg. Estrogen levels begin to rise, boosting energy, mood, and physical performance. During the ovulatory phase, this is when a mature egg is released from the ovary and becomes available for fertilization. This phase is associated with the highest levels of estrogen and as a result, oftentimes your best physical and mental performance. And then there's the luteal phase, which is marked by a rise in progesterone, which helps maintain the uterine lining in case of pregnancy. However, if fertilization does not occur, progesterone levels drop, leading to the shedding of the uterine lining and the onset of menstruation. The luteal phase, I don't think is anyone's fave. It can feel like a hormonal roller coaster. This is when many women will experience PMS symptoms like fatigue, irritability, bloating, gas. So what does the science say about exercise performance? Is it impossible to PR on your period? Is your ovulatory phase the only time that you should be training at a higher intensity? Well, in this 2021 review, they examined the impact of menstrual cycle on athletic performance with a big focus on comparing perceived performance versus objective performance, basically trying to determine if it's all in your head. Across five studies, they found that most athletes believe their performance is affected by their menstrual cycle, whether that's strength, speed, or power, with most subjects agreeing that these negative effects occurred most often in the early follicular and late luteal phases. And now something I'll flag here, and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier with some of the issues with the existing science on menstrual cycles, is that even when you get a higher quality review like this, they may use inconsistent terminology. So for example, in this review, they refer to the menstrual phase as early follicular, which while technically correct, can be confusing when you're comparing findings. In the same review, they examine the effects of menstrual cycle on objective performance. So how you're actually performing versus how you feel like you're performing. And across 35 studies, 15 found that at least one performance metric was impacted by cycle phase, while 20 studies found no impact. Zeroing in on that early follicular and late luteal phase that most women felt like negatively impacted them, only seven out of the 24 studies that measured performance in these phases found objective performance to be diminished. This review then went on to summarize findings by their impact on anaerobic, aerobic, and strength performance. So anaerobic means anything that is explosive and powerful. Think jumping, sprinting, aerobic performance would be your continuous effort activities. So think long distance running, any sort of endurance sport, and then strength is how heavy can you lift. In this graphic, each arrow represents an outcome reported to fluctuate throughout the menstrual cycle, where the direction of the arrow indicates a relative reduction in performance. So if an arrow starts in the early follicular phase and points to the late luteal phase, that means that metric decreased from early follicular to late luteal. As we look at this graphic, we can draw a couple conclusions. The late luteal phase is the most affected as compared to any other, and not all performance metrics rise and fall in the same ways. For example, if you're a distance runner training for a marathon, you may have a different perception of how your cycle affects performance as compared to a power lifter whose goal is pure strength. So what does this mean? What do you do with this information? Well, the first time I read this review, I felt like they were saying, it's all in your head. I got angry, I circled back. When I read it again, especially looking at that last graphic, this highlights the need for more research and more research that isolates for how different performance metrics are affected by different phases of your cycle because your perception of exercise performance is going to depend on what you're trying to perform with. If you're somebody like me who enjoys doing a bit of everything, 
this is where you can start to see how there may be a case for cycle syncing certain aspects of your training. Now, exercise performance is just one consideration when it comes to cycle syncing. And I'd actually argue that a limitation of that review is that most studies focused on high level female athletes, women whose priority is sport, they want to be physically active. There is incentive for them to be physically active. But if you zoom out, high level female athletes represent a relatively small portion of the female population. They do not represent women with competing priorities, women who maybe have to budget their energy more carefully, which is a crucial consideration when it comes to workout programming for consistency. If you dig deeper into these research reviews, you'll often find them talking about things like how hormonal changes can affect tissue stiffness, how estrogen impacts force production, and how both of these things can impact your injury risk. But what you don't often see reflected is the bigger picture for female health, let's call it, how these same cyclical changes can affect your pelvic function, your digestion, both of which can then impact your perceived exertion and again, that motivation equation. Throughout your menstrual cycle, the position of your cervix changes. During ovulation, it's at its highest, whereas during your period, it's at its lowest. When you combine that with the hormonal changes, bloating and gas that are common leading up to your period, this can contribute to feelings of pelvic heaviness. If you struggle with pelvic dysfunction, this can also worsen those symptoms. And so high intensity and high impact exercise may feel extra challenging. A common misconception is that pelvic dysfunction only affects women who've been pregnant or have children, but that couldn't be further from the truth. In this 2024 study, they examined how the menstrual cycle affects pelvic floor function. The study included 477 athletic and non-athletic women ranging in age from 16 to 63 years old. It's estimated that 25% of women may experience pelvic dysfunction in their life, though the true number is likely higher due to so many women remaining undiagnosed. This study pulled women on a range of daily pelvic symptoms, and it found that the medium underdiagnosis rate was 67.6%. As for how these women were impacted by cycle phase, 41.3% of participants reported heightened symptoms during the start of their period, while 38.8% experienced new or worsened symptoms leading up to their period, both of which are consistent with what we know about how your anatomy and hormones change throughout your cycle. Moving over to digestion, as an IBS girly, the period is not always a good time for me. Progesterone can have a muscle relaxing effect, and this doesn't just affect your workout muscles, but also all of the smooth muscle lining your digestive tract, which when progesterone rises in your luteal phase, this can contribute to bloating, gas, constipation. But wait, there's more. Because as your period starts and progesterone decreases, prostaglandin levels rise, which can increase bowel contractions and contribute to symptoms like diarrhea. Combine this with any sort of pelvic dysfunction, IBS, or a digestive condition, and knowing that high intensity and high impact exercise can irritate your gut, the case is getting stronger for cycle syncing your training. So beyond there being a lack of research, one of the major critiques I hear about cycle syncing is like, what's your goal? What are you optimizing for? Because if it's exercise performance, yeah, there is a lack of research. But as a trainer who has worked with thousands of women who chats with many of you every day in the end app, I love our new comments feature. The number one consideration for most women should be consistency. And if you find that you really struggle to maintain your workout routine leading up to or during your period, then cycle syncing may be a helpful strategy because consistent training, even if some weeks it's at a lower or different intensity, will get you so much further, even with exercise performance, as compared to trying to force yourself to maintain the same routine week after week when your body is clearly resisting. So that is it. For today, I hope you found this helpful. I hope that maybe this was a different or more balanced perspective than what you've seen on cycle syncing. Next episode, we're gonna get into application. So how you can actually cycle sync your workouts, how you can be more proactive in supporting your body with your training. But that's it for today. So I would love to hear what you think. I'd love to hear if you're still a cycle syncing hater. If you were a former hater, who's maybe a little bit curious now, if you already are cycle syncing, what your experience has been, I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching and I can't wait to see you in the next episode.